Should you freeze your dry goods before packaging them for long-term storage? Hey, Provident Preppers, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Kyleen. And one of the questions that I am asked all the time is if you need to freeze your dry goods before you package them for long-term storage. And so this video is dedicated to all of you who've asked that question. And the answer is actually yes and no. And the reason why is because, well, wait, before we get to the reason why, let me tell you something. So as a resource, we are using a guide to food storage for emergencies. And this is a really good resource. We'll leave a link in the description of this video, but there are research studies that are documented that say that what we are saying here is true. And because there's a lot of different rumors out on the internet and some of them are not helpful so and might be hurtful it could be anyway so that's where the information comes from so there are two reasons why we do something to preserve our food for um, long term right the first one is bugs things like weevils moths and flower beetles we don't want any of that growing in our food storage so we have to create an environment that is inhospitable that will kill them dead um, and the second one is oxidation and oxidation can degrade food quickly. So if you are able to put the dry goods in an oxygen free or redu reduced oxygen environment, you will significantly extend that shelf life. So those are the two main reasons why we preserve food. So the freeze thaw freeze method will only get rid of the bugs. So let's talk first of all exactly what the freeze thaw freeze method is. So say you brought this cornmeal home from the store and you want to package it for long term. Um, if you are just going to kill the bugs, you need to put this in a moisture proof container. And the reason why is because if you get moisture in here, you're going to have problems in your storage. Yeah. So you're going to put this in like double Ziploc bags or in like a Tupperware container, something so that moisture can't get in it. Then you're going to put anything that's like between one and 15 pounds. You'll put it inside the freezer for two to three days. And then you're going to take it out and you're just going to let it thaw at room temperature. And what this does is it wakes up the bugs, the eggs, and says, oh, it's springtime. It's time to hatch. And then those critters will um, begin to hatch. And then you put it back inside the freezer, inside of its airtight con or moisture proof container for two to three more days. Then you're going to take it out, let it completely thaw, return to room temperature and then package it. Now the one um, caveat to that is, say I'm packaging it in this um, plastic bottle, right? We have an entire video on how to do food storage in um, peat plastic bottles. So if you click the card in the corner, it'll take you there. But this is already packaged in a moisture proof container, right? So I could put this directly in the freezer for two or three days, pull it out, bring it to room temperature, put it back in for two or three days, pull it out um, and let it return to room temperature and then just store it. I could totally do that, right? Um, so that is, and that's kind of a good way to do it depending on your packaging. Now, um, the second way um, to preserve it is much better. So if we were to use oxygen absorbers, like um, I keep mine in this little jar, once I've opened a package, but I, I really like the ones from Wallaby because they're packaged in little packages of 10. Now for anything under one gallon, you only need a 300 cc oxygen absorber. For a quart, you could use a 100 cc oxygen absorber, but quite frankly, I always use um, the 300, 400, or 500. And the reason why is because I only want to have one kind open at a time. And so it's completely yeah. for convenience sake, you can oversize it, but you should never undersize it. But what the oxygen absorber will do is it will take that oxygen level down to less than point or than 0.1%, right? And so there's hardly any oxygen in there. Bugs can't live if there's no oxygen. So if, if you're gonna do this, it doesn't make any sense to freeze at first because this is gonna kill the bugs. 
So this is just, if you freeze it, you're just putting it at risk for moisture and using time that you didn't need to. Because all I do is I'll take one of these oxygen absorbers if you want to um, package it in the glass. I'll just drop the oxygen absorber in here and I'll pour my cornmeal in here, put the lid on nice and tight, and then within a day you should see this suck down and um, and it will, all the oxygen will be removed, right? It'll be tied up inside of that oxygen absorber. Sometimes they're called oxygen um, scavengers, but it, it's the same thing. Now with these oxygen absorbers, um, you can also use them in a mylar bag. You would there's a little trick to this and I think I'm, I think I'll take a minute and show you before we move on to vacuum sealing. So I can do this two ways. I can just dump this directly in here, right? Or if I want to keep it in its original bag, I can take a knife and I can just slit this right here. Just stab it in there. In fact, let's go ahead and do this. So I have my oxygen absorber and I am just going to make a little slit and put it in here. Now, the reason why I need to put it in here is because if I were to just put the oxygen absorber in the bag, oops, if I just put it in here with this bag closed, I can't reliably remove that oxygen. So I'm gonna just take this and I'm gonna slide it in here. The oxygen absorber is already inside there, right? And I'm just going to seal the top of this. Now, I do have to heat seal this. So I'm going to take my flat iron and seal the top of this or use an impulse sealer. And I'm going to seal this shut and I'm going to label it. But so now this is all packaged in here. It's actually in the original packaging. So this this is a great way to do it. But oxygen absorbers, hands down, are the best way to do that. Sometimes we're asked if you need to use both an oxygen absorber and vacuum seal, and it just kind of depends on what you want to do. If you're using an oxygen absorber, there's no need to vacuum seal. If you're vacuum sealing, you might want to use an oxygen absorber for a backup. Um, does that make sense? So talk about oxygen or talk about vacuum sealing. Okay, so vacuum sealing is a great way to go. Um, and sometimes people feel more comfortable because it does pull the bag down. It sucks it down. Um, that makes them feel better and that's okay. That's fine. But it's really doing the same job as an oxygen absorber. It pulls that oxygen out of there and then you seal that shut and you get the same result. You're in a low oxygen environment so the bugs aren't going to be a problem and the oxidation won't be a problem. Now, one of the things is that you can buy a cheap vacuum sealer and be fooled into thinking that you've actually taken it down to that less than 1% level, and that's not true. And so you have to be super careful that if you're going to do vacuum sealing, it's more of an expensive um, a device, right? Because the cheap ones just can't suck that much air out. You need to maintain um, a level of less than 1% oxygen for at least 12 days to kill the bugs. Yeah right, at least 12 days. But one of the things that um, you can do with a food saver um, or a vacuum sealer that's a good quality is you can take it and you can vacuum seal these jars and then you can reuse them over and over again. And that's really kind of nice. Yeah. So now that we've talked about this, remember now when we've vacuum sealed or used an oxygen absorber, we've taken the oxygen level down to a low enough level that it's going to prevent oxidation of the food, which means the food is going to last significantly longer. Now, you don't ever want to do this with moist foods. Good candidates are 10% or uh, moisture or less because moist foods in a low oxygen environment are ideal for growing botulism and that's very dangerous and we don't want to do that. So make sure that you're using dry goods when you do this. Now, John's going to talk to us about some things you shouldn't, should not, should not do. Right. And there are all these kinds of things out there floating around the internet and amongst people. Um, but let's just read about some of these. One of them is heating. To control insects by heating, preheat the oven to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Place the grain in a pan and heat for 30 minutes. Grain may also be placed in the microwave and heated on high for 10 minutes. Heating in the oven and the microwave at these settings will both prevent germination. Uh, heating may work for some dried foods, but others may be changed organoleptically, which means it's going to change the taste or the color, or the feel, or the odor. Um, 
Not, so, not a method I would recommend, yeah, honestly. So why am I going to do this to kill the bugs if it's going to make it so it doesn't taste good when there's other methods available? The other thing, it did say that it will prevent it from germinating. So if you're storing any type of wheat or seeds or dried beans or something that you're going to want to sprout, this method is not a method you want to use. You don't want to introduce heat. Okay. Another method is diatomaceous earth, um, which is not recommended. The use of diatomaceous earth, or DE, as an insecticide is a, a commercial alternative to traditional chemical insecticides. Uh, diatomaceous earth is of natural origin, leaves minimal residue on the product, and has a low mammalian toxicity. Uh, diatomaceous earth activates the waterproof lipids of insects, causing them to die through desiccation. While overall, diatomaceous earth works well as an insecticide, specific diatomaceous earth formulations must be tested for activity in each product and against each insect species. In addition, while diatomaceous earth is not a chemical hazard, it is an inhalation hazard. Thus, the nature of silica powder in diatomaceous earth determines the risk. This makes home inse um, insecticidal use impractical and potentially harmful. So again, one of those that, let's just not go there. Yeah, it's not a, a preferred method, it's not an approved method. And you will hear of people who really, that like they want to take a cup of it and mix it in with their grain um, in the buckets, but that risk of inhalation is pretty good, and for me, there are so many better ways to accomplish this. I will use diatomaceous earth um, in my garden against my squash bugs, but I don't want to be eating it. I want the bugs to eat it. Good so. point. Okay, now these get, to me, get a little bit weird. Bay leaves, chewing gum, mint flavored or otherwise, tenpenny nails or salt, not recommended. These treatments are old, considered old wives' tales, and there is no research-based evidence that they work. So, um, again, we're just not going to go there. They don't work effectively. They're not reliably tested. Um, I wouldn't use them. And you hear people swear because grandma has done this for years, right? But we had one of our viewers who um, was gifted a bunch of barrels of grain and they had been stored, layered with lots and lots of bay leaves, right? And the, other than that, they were stored and they were sealed up appropriately and they were infested with bugs. So it, I just would stay away from it. When there are better ways to do it, I would do it in a way that's been tried and proven because you spend so much money on your food storage. Yeah. Um, don't risk it, don't risk it. Okay, um, another one, garlic, which is also not recommended. Garlic has been studied as a method of insect control. Studies show some success, but the insect destruction was not complete. Uh, garlic would naturally add flavor and odor to the dried foods, which in a lot of cases, you don't want that garlic flavor in there. For that reason, it is not recommended. So everything so. would taste garlic. One time we stored um, some of our wheat in buckets that had held bubble gum, right? And so the bu buckets <laughs> smelled like bubble gum. And when I made bread, it kind of tasted like bubble gum. It was really yeah. kind of funny, but I wouldn't feel. But a good have, learning experience yeah, for us. Experience. Yeah, it probably just won't go there. We can use the buckets for other good things, but uh, yeah, not that. Okay, and the last one here, hand warmers. Now this one's pretty interesting to me too. At least a few people are recommending hand warmers for oxygen absorption. Uh, they theorize that the ingredients are the same. However, this is akin to using a toilet plunger for a baseball bat. They both are wood, yes. They will technically work somewhat, but it may not work well. And the product is simply not made for that use. So again, just something that you, you don't want to go there. Um, these things are all over out there, but they're not effective and they're not proven and I wouldn't use them. Because it's so expensive, right? And when you open this, you want to make sure that it's safe to eat and that you're not getting your extra protein from the bugs in there because that's kind of not a fun way to get protein. But um, first of all, remember we left a link to this article, a guide for food storage for emergencies. And there are research studies for all this. You can go and research it yourself. Don't believe what crazy people on the internet like us tell you. <laughs> go and do the research yourself. But for just a little bit of money, right? Oxygen um, absorbers really aren't that expensive. You can save money by putting it in repurposed um, 
plastic bottles, right? And like I said, we have a whole article on that. You can use canning jars and reuse them over and over again. You can save jars that like your pasta sauce came in and you could use them with an oxygen absorber and just use them over and over again. There's all kinds of ways to save money when you do this, but I wouldn't skimp on oxygen absorbers just because it'll make it last longer because it reduces the oxidation and it prevents bugs. So that's my take on it. I think that's exactly right. And, and we hope this has been good at clarifying what works and what doesn't work. And now, now wait, wait, oh, go so, ahead. So the take home, the take home here, right, is do you need to freeze it? No. Yeah. You that's, only need to freeze your dry goods if you don't have oxygen absorbers or if you don't have a good vacuum sealer to be able to do it. You don't need both. You don't need to use more than one method. If you, can you use both oxygen absorbers and vacuum seal it? Yes, you can. If it makes you feel better. Do you yeah. need to if you have oxygen absorbers? Not if you're using oxygen absorbers. If you're vacuum sealing, you might want to because it might not take it down to a low enough level. Got it? So you only need to freeze it if you can't use these other methods. Okay, now for the question of the day. What are you doing to take care of your long-term food storage needs? Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.